Hello there, my name is Jordan Leroy Hansen, also known as LeDev, and I do have to apologize for the lack of video contents for the past few weeks. It's been a very, very busy schedule at our household and such. Mostly, I just got started back working two jobs, pretty much a paraeducation job and also a job at part-time job at a restaurant, so trying to balance the time between making content and doing this is a little tricky. I'm trying my best now and trying to pretty much consolidate and also work on the schedule for content creation as well as streaming. It's a little tricky, but I'm trying my best on it. Nevertheless, one video I wanted to try to get out before the big Throne of Eldraine spoiler season start, as we're anticipating the future of the net set as well as the set rotation, which allows us to pretty much say goodbye to some really annoying cards. <coughs> to very... <coughs> yeah. Oh, wait. It's either that or I would say Kira's Obsession, personally for me, but still, I kind of want to focus on cards that I feel like kind of lose the spotlight due to the popularity of some deck archetypes and such. Because remember, we have about four sets rotating out specifically, aka Ypsilon, Rivals of Ypsilon, Dominaria, and Magic Core Set 2019. And I feel like there's some cards that kind of not got their spot in the limelight just yet. I'm not saying, per se, that they are going to be meta-defining cards for the last few weeks or their cards to recommend crafting. Actually, I am going to say the one big disclaimer here. The cards that I'm going to put on this list, which the cards to try out before rotation happens, I would not... The biggest disclaimer I could say is I would not recommend using your wild cards on these cards. Honestly, I would say try these cards out if you already have them in your collection. I would not waste a wild card, or if we're going past November, the two wild cards. You know, actually this video is going to just be talking about the cards I say to try out, but I'm actually going to kill, I guess put in an MTG arena terms, Teal Healing Hawks with one Chandra Pyro Helix, and just pretty much get also my opinion on the historic update that's going to happen within the Nets uh, patch. And honestly, it's one of those I'm interested, but there is a little bit of a eh to it. Now, the thing that they mention is that they are going to attempt with the Historic mode. Okay, for clarification for people who don't know, Historic is their name for the new Extended format, aka pretty much what you can do to play with cards that have rotated out, as well as standard cards as well, so... It confused some people, since some people do remember Historic as a mechanic from Dominaria. Honestly, I do find it just kind of a cute little name for the format, but I understand if you did not hear what the format is, you'd probably get confused by the title originally hearing it. I mean, I had a few friends that were kind of confused that don't play much Arena that got confused by the name Historic Format, and they thought it was just play with all artifacts and legendaries, etc, etc. Nevertheless, it's the name of their new extended format, and they're going to introduce it within the Throne of Eldraine patch. Now, what they're going to do is they're going to have it where it's originally just going to be having modes like best of three rank from what I heard, as well as just essentially starting out with a best of one, if my memory serves me correct. It was a big article, so I had to kind of skim note through it. Nevertheless, though, one of the interesting more interesting developments that they had of it is the fact that they are considering, in fact will, introduce new cards within the historic format that won't be legal within the standard format. Some suggestions that they put off like is Brainstorm, or Worm Coil Engine, or Firebolt, or such. And I with some very old nostalgia cards that many people who played Magic in the earlier days are very nostalgic for. Though, Honestly, every time somebody hears Worm Coil Engine, a lot of people say that that's probably not the best idea for the game. They think that card's a little too powerful. Granted, it's powerful, but I never played for Mirrodin, so... Mirrodin Standard or Mirrodin Modern, so... I mean, it'll be interesting. The fact that they are going to introduce pretty much cards that are from non-sets into this format to try to shake up the meta is really cool. They're also considering adding exclusive, pretty much, events for this format, such as, like, a historic draft, or even just... I would be... I would love it if they have, like, a historic cube or something, because that would be really, really cool. So, the factor... And 
Ah, black brain fart. Sorry, just collecting all my bots here. Also, the fact that with these events, you can actually get access to these historic cards, such as, like, if they introduce it, Brainstorm, Worm Coil Engine, etc., etc., etc. Now, all that seems exciting, right? It was actually really exciting. Like, I remember hearing that news, and I was like, Ooh, this is going to be interesting make some new deck brews try to do some janky stuff within the historic format that sounds awesome there is one eensy weensy tingy little catch now the catch is technically speaking as when the patch goes up technically the wild card conversion rate to cat craft historic part cards will still be one to one like one rare card equals one rare wild card etc etc However, when November comes around, it's actually going to then cost two wild cards to actually craft a historic card. So in other words, for example, let's say I want a Sun Crested Pterodon and such. Well, if I wanted that card past November, it would cost me two common wild cards to actually craft it. To say that the response was not positive to that news would be kind of an understatement. <laughs> yeah, a lot of negative press had happened due to that news and such, and it was kind of a buzzkill if I'm personally honest with you. Though, I will be slightly optimistic in saying that I don't think this is a quote-unquote rule of the law, this is the way they're going to approach Historic forever. Honestly, I think it's more of a bad idea, but I think it's a temporarily intentional bad idea. And here's the reason why I think that. I think this is one of those things where they're putting the gate there because the thing of the matter is, historic format, mostly the reason why standard has been kind of like the power level and kind of like balanced, depending on who you ask, as it is as the moment, is because they had the R&D, the design team that they had at Watsi and such to overall try to keep the format balanced and healthy for people to play it. Now, the Catch-22 is, well, they're going to introduce a new format that's going to not only introduce the pretty much standard cards that we are known to and used to, they're also going to introduce a bunch of new cards with the fact that they're introducing cards from different sets into the format as well as the power level of the standard set in the fall introducing into this historic mode. And I feel like they're kind of worried of an overall balance of the format, and I don't want people heavily invested in it initially until they tweak out the format, see how it goes, also make sure that maybe they're doing bugs and such, like bug checking to make sure the format works. And I think they make the cost initially not as a way of saying, Oh, I got all these historic cards before it costs you a lot of money. <laughs> no, I don't think it's that. I think it's more just a want to be very, very cautious on people starting into the format until they iterate on it and try to make sure that it's good enough that they feel like that they will take off the costs. I think the cost is not a permanent fixture of the arena client. I think it's just a temporary fix until they think historic format is in a condition that is they think would be safe to introduce the back the one-on-one -on -one wild card cost ratio. That's my personal opinion. Still, I do think it's kind of a buzzkill, and I do think they do have to attempt the backpedal on that if they can, because ugh, the negative press on it press on it is nothing to underestimate. Still, nevertheless, that's my two cents. Let's actually get on to the main cheese of the video, which is actually talking about cards that I think, if you have them in your collection, I'd say give them a shot. And I'm going to do it from two cards from each color, slash colorless, and even lands. So with that, let's actually go into white. And the two cards from white that I would say to give a shot if you have the chance, one of them personally is Goring Ceratops. 5-2 white, creature dinosaur, free free, double strike. When it attacks, other creatures you control gain double strike until end of turn. Honestly, I know that this card is not the most, the best played card in the world. It's a really slow card being at 7 mana. But still, this effect is relatively a very powerful effect. And we have a ton, and I mean it, a ton of ways to get this out pretty cheap. We have a bunch of reanimation spells. We also have ways to give it haste. We even have Ilharg, though I do think the Ilharg trigger doesn't work on this since it has to attack itself. 
But still, we have ways to... I mean, the one that I could think of right off the bat is Bond, is Bond uh, Revival, I believe is the name. It's the five-cost sorcery spell that essentially returns a target creature card from your graveyard, give it haste. There's a bunch of variety of methods that you can actually use to actually get this card out relatively earlier than it would be initially. And honestly, I think it's just kind of like a fun kind of way to make like Mardu dinosaurs a thing, actually. Just reanimate gory ceratops and then just go to town. The other card I would recommend giving a shot if you have the chance before rotation happens is kind of a personal favorite of mine, even though I know the card is not good at all. And honestly, it's ever a Halicon Witness. 4 2 white for 4 4 lifelink, and it has the activated ability of exchange of life total with ever a Halicon's Witness's power. Now, is this card perfect? No. Is this card. The problem with this card is that it's kind of. You're paying a lot for those stats, like being a 4 4 for 6 mana with lifelink is just kind of eh, and it dies to a lava coil. But still. Like I said before, and it kind of goes under the same argument as, I would say, with Goring Ceratops, there are ways to get this out earlier, there are ways to get pace. I do feel like there are methods to actually get the combat damage in, and then be able to do the activated ability to exchange a life total with Ever, Witness's power, so you can essentially make it where you can either go in for potential lethal damage, or at least get a significant amount of life, pretty much life gain. Now, I think you should only try this card in, like, decks that do benefit off the life gain synergy, like Orzhov life gain and all that stuff. I think it's a one of if you have it in your collection. It's a fun card to at least try out, and just give it a shot. Also, one honorary mention I will mention before I even continue is I would feel remiss if I didn't talk about, and one of them will be on the list, but I would feel remiss if I didn't talk about... Honestly, one of my favorite cards from the favorite mechanics, and I really hope that From the Drain provides this. Let me get to it. Okay, this is the more popular example, but I'm going to get to the one that actually is, but Sagas. Like, Triumph and Euron. I really want them to see Sagas come back and such, at least in a future set, or in From the Drain, fingers crossed. Sagas, I would say, if you have them in your collection, get them a shot. I know there's the popular ones, like History of Banalia... Heck, even some people play Mormari's Conjecture. But I would say give a shot to the ones that are not so popular. One's going to be on the list when we get to green, but just mention, try out the Sagas when you can, because the Sagas are a lot more fun than you initially remember when playing them. Anyway, now let's go on to the next color before I forget. Let's hop to blue. And blue, I think the one card, if I remember correctly, let me get to it real quick. One card I would say to give a shot at is one that actually has already been seeing a little bit of popularity is Metamorphic Alteration. This is a really, really cute card from N19. It has the ability to enchant a creature, and that enters the battlefield, choose a creature. Enchanted creature is a copy of the chosen creature. Now, honestly, this is more I would recommend kind of like in a... Either you put it in kind of like a token deck and you try to see if the opponent's going into kind of like a mid rangey strategy and then you can copy the opponent's most powerful creature. Or you kind of play it in your own kind of mid range deck and then just play, just have one that could either copy tokens or have stuff where you can copy your powerful creatures and such. There's just a lot of cute tricks you can do with this. The one cute trick that actually someone did got away with, I think it's Alice, it's Elias or. I am forgetting the name of the streamer, and I feel bad for this. Like I said, this video is kind of a little bit off script, so... There's one who actually did a really good combo with this card, where essentially they take Obnitzlis the Torment... Obnitzlis... Uh, I'm forgetting the name. I think it's the Corrupted Hated or something like that. It's the 5-drop uncommon Obnitzlis from War of the Spark. And then what they do is they make the opponent have a creature, then they... Play Villas from their hand, which Villas has the ability that whenever you get dealt damage, you draw a card. And then what they do is they essentially play Metamorphic Alteration on the opponent's creature, making a copy of Villas. And then they try to give them an additional creature or hope they have a second creature on the field. Destroy that creature, make them draw cards. Due to Obnitzel's effect, they're going to lose life. But then due to Villas' effect, they draw cards, which then allows them to draw, pretty much draw out the entire deck and lose 
a lot of life. It's actually a really hilarious way to actually win a game of Magic. Now, there are other ways you can mess with Metamorphic Alteration, and honestly, I would say just even in your popular brews, like your Soul Tide Midranges or Bant Midrange, give this card a shot, and I think you'll be kind of pleasantly surprised by it. The other card that I would put on the list, and I would feel remiss if I didn't talk about it, would be, let's see, let me get to it. Aha! One of the sagas, the Antiquities War. Now, this one, honestly, my the only reason why I put it on the list of cards to try out is because we are currently in a meta where there's a lot. And I mean a lot of really good artifacts and such. And I feel like Antiquities War is just a really cute win condition, and there are way we have multiple ways to actually play artifacts really quick, like with Mystic Forge. And we also just have some really powerful old artifacts that will be rotating out, aka I'm gonna miss your treasure map. I'm gonna miss you so much. <laughs> but there's a lot of way to get a lot of artifacts, like using stuff like even Psy, Master Phopterus, and such, that you can actually just relatively use this card for a tutor effect, as well as an overall victory condition. So overall, Antiquities War, I'm gonna miss ya. Also, honorable mention for me is Gen of Wishes. This one, I feel like the factor that I'm kind of surprised people are not trying it out since Proliferate is a mechanic that we currently have in Standard. Now, it is slow, don't get me wrong, but I do feel like you can do some pretty cute things with it. Even as a one-of in a mid-range deck, I think there's just some really fun, hilarious things you can do. Just the factor that you can essentially play free spells from the top of your deck. From the top of your deck. Plus, hey, we all need a good wish once in a while. Also, let's see. Now we go from blue all the way to black. Now black, I would feel remiss if I didn't talk about one of my favorite bad cards. And even though I'm going to admit, this is a bad card. But I would feel totally, totally bad if I didn't talk about Grim's Captain's Call. Two and a black, sorcery spell, return a pirate card from your hand, from your graveyard, to your hand. Then do to the same for vampire, dinosaur, and merfolk. So essentially, this is a free mana return for cards, presuming you have both a pirate, a vampire, dinosaur, and merfolk in your graveyard. To me, this is kind of one of the more hilarious kind of like restock spells that we have currently in the standard at the moment. Now, the problem is, originally when it came out, it was really, really hard to make a mid-range value deck that had both a dinosaur, a vampire, a merfolk, and a pirate. It's really, really hard. Though I do think it's actually a lot more possible now to give it a shot again in the standard format, mostly because of a few things. One, we're, we're pretty much the set before rotation happens, so... We are at the max amount of both vampires, dinosaurs, merfolks, and pirates that I feel like you can, especially some that came just from the core set, like we literally have a merfolk pirate. Let me rephrase that again. They subscribe on Cutthroat, we have a merfolk pirate. We even have a zombie dinosaur if you want to be very thematic and such. So I feel like people could try a four color to maybe even a soul tie mid-range deck that has all these creature types and just use grim captain's call as a two or even free of just to be good as a restock engine now like i said i still think it's not a great card but i still really like this card just because the really it's a cheeky card it's one of those cheeky mid-range value restock cards I really would challenge someone to try to make a deck around this card because i would love to see it also, one other thing, the one artifact that is the free cost, like Tomb, which essentially whenever a card leaves a graveyard, create a bat token. This card is a way to actually make a lot of bat tokens, if you especially make that deck, so I'm just saying. Just saying. Nevertheless, the other card I would say in black that I would recommend trying out before the rotation happens, and this one, actually seen a little bit of play, even though not many people play it a lot. Fractally Rich came from the core set, and it's just a really good zombie. It's a 5-5 indestructible zombie. When it enters the battlefield, put a phylactery counter on an artifact you control. 
When you control no permanents with it, you have to sacrifice a creature. But honestly, I feel like the ability to just get a 5-5 indestructible zombie is nothing to underestimate. Plus, it's also pretty powerful because it does avoid most of the powerful removal in the meta. Like, for example, the one, like, the spark doesn't target this. And I feel like just this effect alone, plus there's just a lot of cheap artifacts and stuff like treasure map, there's stuff like pretty much even cheap, like, tech card artifacts that you can play in your deck. Or, heck, you could even play that tribal artifact, that free cost stained glass one that I always forget the name of, and just put it into a zombie deck and just play this, put the counter on zombie, there you go. Plus, there's also stuff like with Yorak and stuff, where you can put multiple counters on multiple artifacts to just help keep this alive. I feel like this is a card that if you have it in your collection, and you want to play zombies, you literally just have to give it a shot. I highly recommend it. I wouldn't recommend crafting a card for it, but if you do have a cup, one or two of these, try it in a zombie tribal deck. I think you'd be pleasantly surprised. Now, honorable mention... Honestly, this is one that I never understand how I've never seen play. Bona's Hunger. Bona's Hunger is just a really, really good card. <laughs> it's kind of one of those really good competitive cards, because it's a instant speed edict. Now, on the other hand, people are going to be like, but Liliana's Triumph. Yes, but... The fact that you can have the Itsend ability on this is absurd. If you can have a good mid-range value deck that you can essentially get to the City's Blessing relatively easy, sometimes token decks, or even, like, I'm surprised this actually doesn't see playing Vampires as a tech card, because they usually get to the City Blessings really, really quick, and you can just use this as a way to just instant, when the opponent tries to play their Bribo and Cutthroat, or play a couple of tokens, oh hey, you're gonna have to sacrifice half those if the City's Blessing happened. Is it a perfect card for the meta? No, and it doesn't help that Free Drop to Fairy does kind of negate the instant speed aspect of this card. But I think even with that, I do like this card a lot because it's an edict that can get bigger. And you should never underestimate an edict that gets bigger. It's a card that I say if you have at least, and also it was a perfect draft card, so that's why I'm kind of also slightly recommending it on the honorable mention. So if you have at least one or two of these, seriously, if you have any Edith-like strategies, I think this card is just really something that needs to be tried out before the meta rotates. Now, we're going from black all the way to red. And red, I do have a couple of ones that I do really like a lot. But I will stick to the two in the honorable mention. But just to say it, there's a lot of really good red cards. There's stuff like Captain Lannery Storm, there's also just Dragon Egg, even Fiery Cannonade say it, seen play in the meta. But if there's one card that I would say that needs to at least get a shot before, well actually I will just start with the honorary mention because I was going to start the episode with this. Hey, guess what's legal and standard again? Rampaging for Ratsadon. Which honestly is just a really, really good card. Rampage Frostdawn, two and a red for a free three minutes. Player can't gain life. Whenever another creature enters the battlefield, it deals one damage to that creature's controller. Now, many people, when they saw the update to the ban list and saw this unban, they kind of had a question mark on their head because they're like, wait, this card's now only legal for standard for about a little less than a month? Why had this got unbanned all of a sudden? Honestly, I think it's because so they can both... Two reasons. One is so that they can start pretty much Historic off a clean slate, not have any banned cards in the Historic format. It's a combination of that. Plus, honestly, this is probably one of the more cuter tech cards against Bandscape Shift. Because if you have stuff like even Vivian's Arc Bow or ways to cheap this out before the triggers happen with the Field of the Dead triggers... There's some really nifty tricks you can do with this card and just be able to make an opponent lose a significant amount of life due to this card. So, honestly, this is my honorable mention because I think when everybody saw the unbanning, they're like, oh, hey, this is great against Scape Shift. Let's give this a shot, right? Right? Let's give this a shot. So, yeah, Rampage of Frost Sun, kind of a no-brainer as an honorable mention, but the one card that I legitimately love this card 
And I say you really need to give this a shot if you played it in draft and if you played with it. Seriously, we gotta show some appreciation to Sarkon Man here. Sarkon Fireblood, one red red for a free mana, free loyalty planeswalker. Now granted, that's not really special anymore due to War of the Spark and how many free drop planeswalkers that are really powerful we had in that set. Looking at Narset, looking at Teferi, looking at Ashiok. Remind me to do a video about the power level of War of the Spark and how it's been kind of weird for the meta. But anyway, Sarkon Fireblood, though, is a card I legitimately love. The reason why is because as free loyalty, it has a plus one, you may discard a card if you do draw a card, plus one, add two mana in any combination of colors, spin the mana only to cast dragon spells, and a minus seven, which is pretty much a victory condition in some circumstances, which is create four 5-5 five, five red dragon creature tokens with flying. Okay, why do I love this card a lot? One, many people were kind of down on this card because of the plus one ability on this card, the factor that you just essentially loot. However, looting is not an ability to underestimate, and thanks to a new card from Core 19, aka bag of holding, we can actually use the loot effect to our benefit here to actually just put cards in our loot, in our bag of holding, to actually just save for later. Plus, also the other plus one effect, we are at the moment in the meta where we're going to have our max amount of dragons, like we legitimately have a ton of dragons. We had dragons from the core set, we have dragons from, didn't we have dragons in War of the Spark? I feel like we had at least one, I could be wrong too. But pretty much there's been a... We pretty much have our mass accumulation of dragons. Oh yeah, we had Drakisap. That's what I was trying to remember. Drakisap. And I feel like this card is secretly kind of a cute card to try... Pretty much try one more time, make the mono color or even multicolor dragon deck a thing. Because I feel like Sark and Fireblood is just a really, really good card to fuel that archetype. Plus, it's just a good way to draw... It's a good draw engine. It's a good ramp engine. Honestly, this card is just a really good card. So, yeah. One card I'd say that if you were able to draft a couple, at least two or three of these, give it a shot. And the other card I would say in red, that actually, weirdly enough, it's also a Planeswalker. And it still sads me that this card did not see as much play as it did. Jaya. Now, Jaya, yet again, had really a bunch of beneficial effects. Ironically, kind of like Sarkon did. Where it's like at pretty much it had ramp for spells. It also is a good pretty much loot engine where you can discard up to three cards and then draw that many cards. And the emblem to give your spells flashback is nothing to underestimate. I mean, I'm almost tempted if I pulled like a second wild card to at least have a second of these in my collection because I feel like this is one of those cards that is a lot more powerful than people take for granted. Now, is it perfect? No. Did it overall impact the meta? Not really. But it's kind of one of those fun cards that if you want to play like any big spell, kind of like spell decks or any shenanigans of that one, really give Jaya a shot because Jaya is just a really, really fun card. Plus, it's also fun to just hear the voice from this when it's played and all that stuff. I think it's one of these cards I'm going to actually miss when it rotates, to be quite frankly honest, because it's just a really fun card. Now, we only mentioned the honorary mention, but okay. Okay, I know I said I was only going to restrict to one honorary mention, but I gotta talk about this. Sunbird's Invocation. This card is so fun. If you're able to get this on the battlefield, and if you have at least a good red value-oriented deck or a value-oriented deck that has red as a splash, give Sunbird's Invocation a shot in your deck as a one or two of, if you have it, because... Just that ability to get more value from your spell cast is nothing to estimate. Like, the fact that you cast a spell, oh hey, I'm going to dig into my deck and get another spell to add for value. You just, if your deck is build right, you are going to get your value by the tons load with Sunbird's Invocation. One of my kind of favorite cards from Itzalan that was red. So, yeah. Sunbird's Invocation, yes, it's a 6 mana enchantment that technically does nothing, but it's a fun enchantment that if you can go off with it, it's just absurd. <laughs> okay, now we're going to get to the last color, which is green, before we go to the artifacts. 
And this one, I didn't play much green throughout Standard, with the exception of, like, going with my Yerok shenanigans. But one card I would remiss not to talk about, honestly. And this is specifically another saga, Son of Fraley's. One in the green. With the first two steps, until your next turn, creatures you control become Birds of Paradise, essentially. Add one mana of any color. And then the third one is put a plus one plus one counter on each creature you control. Those creatures gain Vigilance, Trample, and Indestructible until end of turn. I just got a few words about this card. And the few words is... Leyline of Abundance. Leyline of Abundance and this card. Leyline of Abundance and this card. I'm surprised no one had tried something yet. Kind of like trying a token-like deck or something with Leyline of Abundance in this card. Because it just feels like a really good synergy to make a really silly kind of like ramp deck. I still don't know what would be the payoff of that deck or such. It might be something I try as a historic deck to try out, but I feel like that combination of Leyline Abundance and Sonic Fraley's and a token-based strategy can lead to some absurd shenanigans. So, yeah. If you have Sonic Fraley's and you have, for some reason, have a playset of Leyline of Abundance, I say... Give it a shot. I think it's one of those, even without the Leyline of Bundus shenanigans, this is just overall a really good value card. Just the factor that you can make your creatures as ramp, which helps you ramp into bigger stuff. I mean, heck, even if we don't go with the Leyline angle, you can still use Sauna Fraley's to sometimes ramp into a Nissa, which... That's nothing to sneeze at if you think about it. So, I would say Sauna Fraley's, give it a shot, you will not regret it. Now, the last card in green, before the honor I mentioned, I would say give a shot at, is... Eh, this one's a hard one, because like I said, I didn't play that much green, but if I had to... From a card that hadn't seen much play... Honestly... Eh, this one's a hard one. You know, I would jokingly say scape ship, but let's be frank, bad scape ship, so... No, but Midian of Dominaria is a good one, but honestly, yeah, Vivian's Invocation. Now, don't get me wrong, Vivian's Invocation costs a lot of mana, and this is more kind of a commander card, but I would say since Brawl is going to be a thing, and if they, for some reason... Oh yeah, by the way, Watsy, if you are watching this for some random reason, if you can introduce Historic uh, Brawl just so that we can play Vivian's Invocation in a deck, much obliged, that would be lovely. Just for the record. But yeah, Vivian's Invocation, though, I think it's just good as a one-of in any good green value-oriented deck. Because the fact that you can dig seven cards into your deck, get a random creature, and put it onto the battlefield... And then when it's put on the battlefield, it deals damage to its power to a target creature and opponent controls. The fact that that's both a way to tutor for a creature, as well as a way to make that creature fight, is ridiculously absurd. I say as a one of or two of. Now granted, this card might not see much play due to the factor that, well, Hour of Devast- or Finale- I always get the factor of the Finale of Devastation is a card now. But I do think that before we go crazy with Finale of Devastation, I do think you should give Vivian's Invocation one more shot. Because there are some times where if you have this in your collection, this card might actually have some fun last week shenanigans before the rotation happens. Honorary mention for me personally is Kamar's Juridic Vow. I think this is personally my favorite sorcery of the bunch. It's just there's a bunch of... Fun shenanigans you can do with Kamar's Druidic Vow, even in the current meta, especially if you're playing, like, the Kefis Legendary deck that's been going around recently. I feel like this as a one or two of is actually pretty cute in that deck, because it allows you to mill cards into your graveyard, as well as to get Legendary Permanents from there onto the battlefield from your library. Plus, it also works as a nice ramp spell, so... Honorary mention, Kamar's Druidic Vow, Foul Sweat. Now... Oh yeah, there is Golden. Is there any golden cards I would recommend to try out before rotation? Like I said, this is really off script, but actually, yes. Yes, yes, yes. There is one. Storm the Ball. 
Now, with the amount of artifacts that we have currently, that's also really good artifacts to play. Why are we not playing Storm the Vault? Because literally, this can be a Tolarian Academy when it flips. And we are at a moment that we can have at least five artifacts on the battlefield. There are ways to approach that. I've seen some people that are able to create multiple service tokens thanks to the new Sahiri, and it's just... Honestly, if you have at least one or two of in your collection, and you like to play... Hint, I think I know the one guy... Hey, um... The one guy who I'm probably going to share this video with that I know who plays Affinity. Hint, hint, wink, wink, nod, nod. You might want to try this card. Wink, wink, nod, nod. Yeah. If you're playing any Affinity or artifact Syndra type decks, and you have this card in your collection, give it a shot before the rotation happens, because <laughs> having a Telerian Academy on your side of the battlefield is nothing to sneeze at. And the other gold card I would recommend... Honestly, if you're going into the Aristocratic type synergies, and i already seen this play a little bit by little bit, Poison Tip Archer. Poison Tip Archer is just a really good card for Aristocratic decks. I have seen this pl from play from time to time. But if you are playing any type of Aristocratic decks, if you like playing Absent Aristocrats and such, I think you play Absent Aristocrats just because of this card. Just the factor that it has the drain effect is really really good plus also has reach and death touch which helps you against flyer decks so yeah i would actually highly recommend poison tip archer is there any honorary mentions i'd say my honorary mention honestly would probably be protein raider yes the fact that you have to attack first to get the clone effect is kind of obnoxious but I think there is a lot of evasive creatures. I mean, heck, we literally have a one-drop goblin that you can just spin a red mana to make it where it's unblockable. There are a lot of ways to actually get this effect pretty easily. And I do feel like this one of the cheapest clones we have, so you can do some pretty absurd stuff. Like, actually, I might just make a Jeskai deck where I actually do that and try to copy Gideon. Okay, note to self. Put that on potential deck ideas. So... So yeah, if you have at least one or two of these lying around, give it a shot. It's actually just kind of fun overall. Now, lands, honestly, I'll both make a recommendation slash also just a quote, quote, wink, wink, nod, nod. Try your chance if you can. This is the one, one recommendation of cards I would recommend crafting if you're going to craft historic cards. Craft the check land cycle. I would say if you can, try to get a play set of these, because honestly, the check lands are just perfect mana in a historic format. So this is my primary recommendation. Now for cards that you have not played in that it's a land that, honestly, I'll probably only make one recommendation here, and it's Detection Tower. Detection Tower is kind of one of those cards where you've seen it played once in a while, but I do feel like it's a card that is a lot more powerful than given credit for. The fact that you can make it where you can make pretty much lo make opponents lose hex proof is a very powerful effect. And we have a lot of can't be targeted creatures hex proof. So if you are in a meta where you see a lot of people playing hex proof creatures, hey, Detention Tower is a very good tech card. But honestly, I would say only do it if you have it. I would not craft this yet until. I don't know if for some reason in historic mode people like to play a lot of hex proof or they find a way to make the pretty much bubble deck i think is what they call it not bubble uh, i'm having a brain fart in the name the modern archetype where you play the cheap uh, hex proof shroud creatures and you enchant the a lot of them so i would say for that that's probably the one recommendation i would say for a land that if you have give it a shot Unless you don't see a lot of people playing Headsproof creatures, then it's kind of eh. But now, before we end this video, let's actually get to some artifacts I would recommend. Honestly, the Honorary Mention, because it's still a popular card, but it's probably one of my favorite artifacts from Standard to date. And that's Treasure Map. Treasure Map is just so good, especially if you're a Jake Brewer. 
I mean, it's not perfect, don't get me wrong, but the factor that you have the Mana Sync Scry ability and the ability that the mana in you invest in it will inevitably become treasures that you can either use for ramp or as card draw, plus also the land you get, which also works at ramp, it's just so, it's so good. It's just one of my favorite. I think I, I know many streamers slash content creators who are going to miss this card and really, really, really hopes that Throne of Eldraine has like some reprint of this card. And I kind of have to agree, because Treasure Map is just kind of one of those cards that is not broken, but the power level is just, it's just right. It's one of those cards that's just, I just love this card so much. Plus, we already are still going to have Treasure Tokens in the meta still, so yeah, I really like love Treasure Map. I really wish this stays, but hey, at least I'll have a few weeks with it before it goes bye-bye. As for cards to try out, one card that's a personal favorite of mine as well as Treasure Map, even though it's kind of corny, Chaos Wand. Now, Chaos Wand is just, honestly, I would only recommend putting this in your deck if you just want to have a laugh. Is it a card that you can be competitive with? Not really, especially since a lot of people are playing at spells, which then kind of kills off this card, so to speak. But there's just some shenanigans you can do where you can actually just use Chaos 1 to activate a board wipe from the opponent at the wrong time, and it's just hilarious. Honestly, I would say this is more just if you want to do some chaotic shenanigans and just see what happens. If you have this card at least one or two of, give it a shot, because Chaos 1 has its moments where it's just hilarious. <laughs> like, I remember times where I actually used this to activate an opponent's draw spell and such, and just... Or use their removal against them and such. Just the mirror-like chaos effect you can do with Chaos Wand is just... It is just lovely. Though it is kind of a teeny bit of a troll card in retrospect, to be quite frankly honest. The other card I would recommend also... It's a tie. I would tie between Desecrated Tomb, mostly because of the Grim Captain's Return, as I mentioned before. Seriously, if you can get that deck to work with Desecrated Tomb, that's going to be hilarious. As well as Dragon Sword, mostly just because, hey, if you're playing Dragons, you'll probably want to play this card because it's a good card draw engine and it's a good ramp engine. But honestly, the one card I would recommend trying out before a rotation happens that's an artifact... Hmm. Honestly, one that I am... S it's slow. This is card's going to be the one I recommend is a little slow, but... Conqueror's Galleon. Don't get me wrong, this card is slow, but the land you get from it is absurd. I mean, look at that. Look at that. It literally allows you to add a mana, draw a card, loot, it allows you to draw a card, and then if you have enough mana, you can, re you can do a restock effect. That's just... And we have enough creatures in the meta that I feel like you can get the crew cost relatively easy. Now the question is, can you actually attack with this before it tries to get removed? That's another story. Don't get me wrong, this is a card that is slow. But if you are playing a grindy control deck of any sort that has any realm of creatures that are going to be on the battlefield, I think Conqueror's Galleon is worth a shot. Plus, one little teeny teeny weeny little thing to mention. There are ways to make it into a creature that doesn't necessarily require quote-unquote crewing it. Just saying. And overall, that took a while, but that's the cards I would say give a shot out, slash also my two cents on the historic update, to try out before rotation happens. And honestly, well... Most of this is off script, and most of this, I'm just sorry if the quality of this is not the best in the world. The one best recommendation I would say in general, as much as I made recommendations of cards, really, I would just say, just go in the arena, look at your past cards, and just give them a shot. Some of them are going to be tech cards, some of them are going to be janky cards, and some of them might be the hidden spice to help boost you up in the meta for a few weeks before Throne of Eldraine rotation happens. But honestly, just 
play with them and just have fun because that's kind of like what magic is and magic to me is just the fun format where you just look at cards you have cards that are powerful cards that are maybe not so powerful but are funny and just play with them and have fun that's to me a personal experience of magic that i love and enjoy and i kind of want to share that experience with everybody with brews and such and that's kind of like why i do this videos and such but honestly my best recommendation is just however you have fun whether it's be competitive or whether it's to make a silly jank brew just try out some cards you don't try out before and you might be pleasantly surprised at some cards whether you'd be surprised at how bad they are or maybe be surprised at how effective they are than you think. Overall, I hope you all have a lovely day. This is Love Dev, signing out.